Hello, my name is Darren Evans. I'm a Professor of Ecology and Conservation here at Newcastle University. And it's with great sadness I share the news with you that Doug Boys unfortunately died two weeks ago. He was due to give a talk today uh, on all of the exciting research findings from his PhD. I was fortunate enough to be one of Doug's supervisors along with Michael Pocock at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, where Doug was mostly based, uh, as well as Richard Fox from Butterfly Conservation. Now, some of you would have been aware of Doug's work and just what an exciting uh, scientist he was uh, as he gave an 1829 talk last year. Um, and he was going to update us with all of his exciting research findings today. Um, now, there is a, a tribute that Butterfly Conservation um, have published that I'll share with you uh, a little bit later. But I just wanted to read uh, a part of the text um, from the tribute regarding uh, Doug and, and Doug's attributes as a scientist. Doug's scientific research on the topic of moths and moth, moth declines was already groundbreaking and had enormous potential. He showed that street lights have a big impact on the local abundance of moth caterpillars, reducing numbers on grass margins by one third and by almost a half in hedgerows. Now, this was the first real world evidence that light pollution is reducing moth populations. He also found as part of his PhD that environmentally friendly LED lights were even more detrimental to moth populations than some of the old style orange sodium street lights. And to collect this data, he spent over 400 hours searching for caterpillars alongside roadsides over the past three years. Um, and when he published this work in August this year, these research findings were met with huge media interest around the world. And maybe some of you heard Doug being interviewed on the radio and television. This is the sort of research that can fundamentally change how we interact with and protect nature and is already having an impact with lighting professionals. Even though his time with us was short, Doug has ensured that our understanding of human impacts on the natural world has taken a great leap forwards, opening the door to better ways for humans and moths to coexist. So we thought it would be a fitting tribute uh, to, to play um, Doug's presentation that he gave last year once again. And for those of you who would be interested in reading uh, the tribute, then we will post that link for you as well. So thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Douglas Boys. I'm a PhD student at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology down in Oxfordshire, where I'm looking at the impacts of light pollution on moths, a project which also involves Newcastle University and butterfly conservation. Thank you so much to the uh, Natural History Society of Northumbria for uh, inviting me uh, to speak today. I'm actually going to be talking about some uh, research that I did at um, Oxford a couple of years ago, 
where I was looking at uh, species of British moth that are um, on the rise, bucking the trend, uh, so to speak, and becoming more common. So when uh, lots of us think about uh, changes in insect populations, uh, thanks to headlines like, like these uh, over the last two to three years, um, we might be uh, rather depressed uh, and, and worried about the state of our insects. Now, I'm not going to talk too much uh, about this sort of um, underlying context, other than just to point out that uh, lots of the studies that have um, led to these headlines have been um, criticised to, uh, to varying degrees uh, in the literature. Uh, essentially, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there is cause for concern about our um, the health of our insect populations, uh, but the hype and hysteria that we've seen uh, in the in the media is not necessarily uh, justified, uh, nor is it helpful. So, yeah, globally, insect uh, populations are not in free fall. Um, many species are stable, and uh, indeed, some species are doing uh, well and becoming much more common. And it's those species that I'm going to be talking about today. So why British moth then? So uh, in Britain we have about two and a half thousand species of moth and this um, massive diversity in, in the number of species translates really nicely into diversity in life history traits and in ecology which means that uh, moths uh, represent really useful ecological indicators and tell us a lot about the health of our countryside. And moths are also functionally important, so they're um, food, uh, really important food for some of our bat species and uh, also some of our birds, uh, and also represent important nocturnal pollinators. Another reason why uh, British moths are a useful group to look at is the amount of data that we have on, on them. Uh, and we have two uh, really important data sets. The first is the National Moth Recording Scheme, which is run by Butterfly Conservation. This is essentially a citizen science uh, scheme. Anyone can contribute data, anyone can contribute records, um, and this has got really good coverage, particularly in recent years throughout, uh, throughout Britain. The second really important data set for British moths is the Rothhampstead Insect Survey, run by Rothhampstead Research. And what's really nice about this data set is that the, uh, the trap design, which is pictured uh, in the middle of this slide, and the operating protocol has never uh, changed throughout the, uh, the history of this um, scheme. So it offers really nice comparable data on abundance. And it's this data set that has allowed us to produce trends like these. So these graphs show the total macromoth abundance. So macromoths are just the larger moths uh, in Britain, uh, and you can see quite steep and steady declines in the in the total number of moths caught in this network of light traps uh, since the late uh, 1960s, particularly in the south of Britain. Uh, now we can take a, a sort of a higher resolution look at um, at these at these changes, um, and so for for these larger moths, for these macro moths, we have about uh, nine hundred species, and we have abundance trends derived from this Rothamsted uh, network of light traps for about a third of these species. Uh, while we have occupancy trends from the uh, National Moth Recording Scheme data, so occupancy is is just a, a range metric essentially. Uh, for about two thirds of our macromoths, and you can see for both in both cases, we've got broadly uh, broadly the same picture. We've got some species which are increasing, showing statistically significant positive trends. Some species that are uh, are not showing uh, clear trends or or are very much stable, and then other species uh, which are are declining. Uh, and of course, uh, as you can see, there are more species declining than are increasing. So if we've got this uh, trend of, uh, of falling numbers of total macromoths and we've got more species declining than are increasing, surely we should be uh, worrying about these declines and these declining species. And, and this is um, undoubtedly uh, true and, and, and uh, absolutely agree with this. But I also think that we shouldn't uh, ignore completely 
uh, the winners of successful species. And, and, and these uh, winners have, have traditionally been neglected, I think, a little bit by uh, conservationists. And there are a few sort of conventional wisdoms and perceptions about uh, winners which have um, prevailed. So uh, there's the idea that um, there are many more uh, losers than there are winners. There's the idea that uh, it's uh, the winners which are very much ecological generalists, while it's those declining species which are uh, habitat specialists. And then there's sometimes this idea that uh, the winners are in some way undesirable because they're increasing um, with all this sort of human activity going on, these positive trends must be in some way a, a negative thing and perhaps that these, these represent pests or weeds or invasive um, species. Uh, and I don't necessarily subscribe to this um, view and I think it's really fascinating actually to think carefully about how these uh, group of winners are doing so well um, in the face of uh, conditions which are proving really detrimental to uh, so many other species. What can we learn from these uh, successful species? Do they hold any uh, insights for mitigating uh, the impacts of the biodiversity crisis? And on a more pragmatic note, uh, it's these successful species ultimately that will be uh, increasingly important for sustaining our ecosystem functioning uh, into the future. It's going to be these winners which are going to be feeding the birds and the bats of the future and uh, pollinating uh, our crops. So to take a sort of closer look at, at the uh, winners among British moths, what I decided to do was just look at the species which showed statistically significant positive trends for both their abundance and their occupancy in these, um, uh, for these previously published uh, trend uh, data sets. And this gives a list of 51 successful British moth species. So this 51 species uh, is, is what, I've, what I've focused on uh, for this study. So here's uh, some examples. Uh, on the, uh, both of these species have uh, colonized the UK uh, during the 1950s. So then they've not been here forever. Um, and they've both spread throughout the UK to um, sort of varying successes. So along this axis, you've got year, and this is the same for all, all the species. It's 1968 to 2016 years that had uh, good coverage for both the uh, uh, National Moss Recording Scheme and indeed the Roth Hampstead Insect Survey. Uh, along this axis, you've got range extent, and this is essentially... Um, you can think of it as the area of a polygon drawn around the species range, excluding any ocean area. Um, and you can see how the cypress pug really has only achieved a moderate range uh, expansion, whereas the uh, Blair shoulder knot has, uh, has expanded much more along this axis and indeed has moved its way all the way uh, up to Scotland. Um, and then this uh, third axis is abundance. This is local mean abundance. So this is the annual total of uh, individuals caught in one of these Roth Hampstead traps um, taken across the traps that recorded uh, that species in, in a given year. And you can see in, in both cases, neither species really increased their local abundance very much. Uh, these scale bars also correspond to the abundance and you can see they both um, have remained uh, in their single figures in terms of the annual totals. Um, for uh, across, across this time series. Some of the species, some of these 51 winners that were on the rise were habitat specialists. So the, the books will tell you that marbled white spot is a species of damp acidic habitats uh, and slender brindle there is a, is a moth of grassy woodland rides. Um, and both have undergone uh, range expansion uh, as they move along this axis, as you can see. But also you've got marked increases in abundance. Uh, so for instance, back in the, uh, in the 70s, your average Rothamster trap was catching fewer than uh, 20 individuals of, of marbled white spot uh, each year. However, recently um, it seems that the, uh, the average uh, count is, is now well above 50 individuals. So really marked increases in, in annual abundance as well as in range for some of these species. 
Here's another habitat specialist. Uh, this is just another way to sort of visualize these changes previously restricted to um, western parts of, of Wales and, and the southwest of England. But as time has gone on, um, it sort of spread further east, now found in uh, northern England and, and central England. Um, and, and the species has also gone uh, increases, significant increases in its uh, local abundance. I'm not going to dwell too much on this slide, other than really just sort of point out the uh, really clear diversity in the uh, in, in the trends and these trajectories that these species have shown. Some species not really increasing in uh, in one aspect, so they might just increase their abundance, but not really show too much range expansion or, or, or indeed vice versa. And also uh, what really strikes me about this is the clear non-linearities in these trends. Species don't show clear smooth trends throughout um, the sort of 50 year study period. Species may remain pretty static for, for, for several decades and then suddenly um, undergo big, uh, big range expansion. Okay, so what I'm going to move on now is the sort of why questions. Um, and this is why are these, uh, why are these moths becoming more common? And I think it's useful to uh, actually break that question down into two um, further questions. So firstly, what are the external driving factors that are causing these uh, moths to become more common? And then secondly, why is it these specific species and, and, and not others which are responding to these external factors uh, positively? So um, in terms of external factors, perhaps the most studied um, external factor in the context of increasing British moths is cleaner air. So this graph on the left, you'll note that the scale is almost identical to the um, scale, the, uh, the temporal scale that the, the moth trends are shown on. And we've had big, um, big improvements in our air quality, particularly things like sulfur dioxide, which is produced when coal is burnt. And um, this cleaner air has uh, allowed lichens, uh, as shown on the right, to grow. The lichens are really a uh, good indicator of clean air. They can't grow if the air is, is dirty. And as the air has cleaned, uh, we've got more lichens. Um, and that has had knock-on benefits for the, the, the sort of uh, group of moths which feed on lichens, or, or more accurately, that have caterpillars which feed on lichens, like the footman moths. So this is a, a really neat little uh, uh, case, a neat little story, and also quite positive, really, that sort of um, our changes in, in, in air quality, the Clean Air Act, for instance, um, how quickly biodiversity can uh, respond and can recover to... Um, to legislation. The second uh, external factor to talk about is conifers. So um, conifer uh, or, or, or woodland cover in the UK, uh, I should say, sort of steadily declined um, over, over many centuries. But uh, around the First World War, there was a huge um, surge in demand for domestic timber. The Forestry Commission was established, uh, which led to quite an aggressive policy of afforestation leading largely to this uh, significant uptick in uh, forest cover in the UK. Um, and this uh, increase in woodland cover is, is predominantly down to uh, plantations, often of, of, of exotic conifers, uh, like shown on that picture of the right, sort of Sitka spruce um, upland plantations. Uh, generally, these, uh, these plantations seen as a, a really quite a, a bad thing um, uh, by ecologists and, and for, for biodiversity, and, and, and indeed if that is true. However, these uh, huge um, uh, sort of expanses of habitat are actually um, perfectly suitable breeding uh, locations for uh, certain moths which can uh, which feed on conifers. Um, so uh, this this big increase in woodland cover has um, uh, led to uh, a large increase in potential habitat for some conifer feeding moths. Uh, another group of conifer feeding moths which has done well are those that feed on cypresses and these have benefited not from our forestry policy but from our gardening trends and these sorts of uh, Leylandii uh, cypress hedges very popular for, for privacy screening 
have become uh, pretty uh, ubiquitous in suburban areas and moths that, 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 that feed on these cypresses uh, seem to have uh, responded positively and, and spread uh, throughout much of the UK as a result of, of, of this gardening trend. So there's a couple of two nice uh, neat external factors um, that could be driving these positive changes. But unfortunately, uh, these two uh, examples only have the potential to explain the positive trends of, of a minority of those 51 species that I looked at. And that's because only four of the 51 species feed on conifers and only six of them feed on lichens. Three species colonised the UK uh, in, in, in recorded history. But for the remaining uh, 38 species, uh, there's no obvious cause for these uh, for these positive uh, trends. So um, I'm just going to go through and give sort of a, a collection of, of theories, a collection of hypotheses for why uh, these uh, moths, uh, some of these moths may be becoming more common and the diversity uh, in, uh, in these moths. So the first point is a bit of a sort of a, a null uh, theory, really. And this is this idea of background biodiversity change, which is linked uh, to background extinction rate, uh, a concept with which uh, I guess many people are familiar. So this is just this idea that if you look back at the fossil record, uh, ecological communities uh, are not static. You know, without the absence of humans, they're not static. Um, there'll be a big turnover in species, species will become common, species will become rare, there'll be a lot of change. So although it's tempting to assume that all these changes that we're seeing uh, in the 21st century are, um, are, are down to human influences, it's always just worth bearing in mind that these, um, that may not be the case and, and, and these, these trends could just be a continuation of, of, of changes that have been happening for centuries. Um, so yeah, that's just worth bearing uh, in the back of your mind. But in terms of the, the more sort of human causes, um, here's, here's one, so habitat changes. Uh, the forestry example uh, uh, is a nice one there. Perhaps another one could be uh, nitrogen deposition in, uh, across the countryside. So again, I've split it into this external factors and then the, these species specific factors. So to take that nitrogen example, some species may have adaptations um, which, uh, which favour the, the high levels of nitrogen that we're now seeing, for instance, feeding on a, a food plant which, um, which grows in, with, is, with high uh, nutrients. Some species may show phenotypic plasticity. Uh, this is essentially just a, a flexibility to um, exploit uh, different environmental conditions. And then uh, evolutionary adaptation. Now, I think this could potentially be really important. I think we often assume that species are static, um, but that's really not the case, especially insects with their uh, uh, short generation times. They can actually uh, adapt quite successfully to changing conditions. Um, so it may be that some species, for instance, are, are adapting to high levels of nitrogen or are switching, actively switching from a native Scots pine food plant to um, Sitka spruce, for, for instance. Um, the next external factor I've put up here is climate change. Now, um, climate change, uh, some species maybe uh, have um, adaptations which, which, which favour them. So, for instance, it seems that uh, species which overwinter as an adult are, do, are faring better in terms of national uh, population trends and species which overwinter as an egg or a larvae. And that maybe has something to do with our changing winters. We're getting more and more warm and wet winters. Again, species may show plasticity, this flexibility to cope with, with different conditions. And again, maybe some species are actively evolving uh, to cope with our changing climate. It's hard to know how important climate change is really for these winners because uh, it, it, it's not so easy to sort of detect a causal, um, a causal link. Uh, but one thing that was clear um, from, from my study was that there were clear signatures of climate change affecting these 51 winners. So uh, many of them shifted their northward range margins 
um, some species moving up to 400 kilometers further north since the 1970s. Many of the species are now flying at different times of year, there's altered phenology, uh, typically flying earlier, especially spring species, some species now flying up to two weeks earlier than they were at the beginning of the study period. And then some species are also showing, um, I think five or six of the winners are showing increased uh, generations, increased voltanism. So each year they'll have an additional generation that they previously didn't have. And you can easily see how if a species is now fitting in three generations per year rather than two, that might allow it to build up higher um, population sizes and therefore uh, become more common. A linked uh, factor to climate change increased migration. Um, and this is something that I've observed in the uh, 11 or so years that I've been moth trapping. We're getting more and more migration of moths into Britain from uh, uh, Central and Southern Europe. And uh, this, is, um, this, this is true for both new species, species that have previously never occurred in the UK, but this is probably also true uh, for many resident species of moth, which have uh, migratory tendencies. Species like large yellow underwing, uh, Cetaceous Hebrew character, angle shays, these species are all known to migrate, even though they, they, they do, um, uh, they're very much common resident moths. So it may be that these positive trends in these uh, groups of species don't really have anything to do with uh, conditions in the UK, but are more just a reflection of, of things happening elsewhere and increased migration. And then the other point uh, linked to migration is the colonization of new genetic diversity. So we're seeing more and more species arriving in the UK. This, this graph shows uh, the number of new colonizing uh, uh, Lepidoptera uh, in Britain. Some of this is down to globalization and the horticultural trade, but actually the majority of these colonizations appear to be uh, natural, if you like, um, in that they're the species are, are spreading up through Europe and crossing the, cha uh, crossing the channel of their own volition and, and, and then becoming established in the UK. So we're getting more new species, but it also logically follows that we'll be getting more diversity of uh, resident species arriving from Europe. And one example of this might be the pine hawk moth. The species shows uh, morphological variation across its European range. And it seems that uh, forms originating from Europe colonized the south coast of, of England during the 20th century. And it seems that these forms were much more uh, genetically fit, perhaps in some way, and much more vigorous and much more successful. And it seems that these forms have quite rapidly displaced uh, the resident populations of this species. And it's, and it's these European uh, this, this, this European race, if you like, which has, uh, has spread throughout much of, of England. Now, pine hawk moth, as the name suggests, uh, feeds on pine trees. So the species uh, may well have uh, also benefited from our forestry policy. And then taking a look at its distribution, I would suggest perhaps it, it doesn't like high levels of rainfall. So there may well also be a climatic element there um, to this species. Um, success. So this example really could um, exemplify many of the, the trends shown for the uh, 51 winners that I looked at. It's not a single simple cause uh, that's, that, that's driving their um, increases, but perhaps a combination of, of multiple, um, multiple factors. Okay, so the, the final point I'm going to just add to this increasingly cluttered diagram is uh, network disruption. And this is just the idea that as uh, ecosystems are disrupted, interactions between species are lost. And this uh, one example of this and why this could be particularly important is parasitism. So parasitism, uh, parasitoid wasps like the one shown will lay their eggs in, in, in host uh, caterpillars, for instance. And this will, uh, the, the caterpillar will die as a result. So this has a suppressing effect on the population as shown um, in this graph. So you can see that if the parasitoid uh, that's the main host of a species goes extinct or locally extinct perhaps because it's 
very sensitive to climate change or, 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 or very sensitive to habitat change, that this could release the host from, um, from, from this control and therefore it would become much more common. So it could be that the positive trends that we're observing in some of the winners could actually be causally linked to negative trends in some of the losers. Okay, so just some take home points then. Uh, despite what you uh, might see uh, in, the, in the sort of headlines and in the press, not all insects are in decline. Successful British moths are highly diverse, both in terms of their natural history, their ecology, but also in, their, in, the, in, in the forms of, of how their success manifests. Now we don't fully understand why certain British moths are becoming more common. However, it's likely uh, in many cases that it's gonna be multiple interacting uh, factors that are causing these changes. And then maybe, uh, is it perhaps time to rethink some of our conventional wisdom about winners and maybe take a more positive and pragmatic um, approach to biological success? Thanks very much to my co-authors listed there, also all the recorders and volunteers who have contributed any data, any time to uh, either the National Moth Recording Scheme or the Roth Hampstead Insect Survey. Uh, if, uh, if this talk has been uh, interested, uh, interesting to you, then uh, please do uh, check out my website. The study um, that this has largely been based on is available on the publications page. It's open access, anyone can read it. Um, so uh, check that out if you're interested. And then on my blog, I've got a, a more general article, not really quite so focused on the moths, but just exploring these general themes of, of, of successful species in the 21st century. So thanks again very much for inviting me. Thank you uh, very much for listening and uh, goodbye. <laughs>